Hey guys, it's Adam from Lucy Pixel, and I wanted to take a quick moment to talk to you directly. Um, you may have noticed that there's a new introduction, or at least I updated it, so hopefully you enjoy that. Um, but if you're particularly observant and you've been following this channel for any length of time, you'll notice that we have also updated the logo for the channel. And um, that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, a couple of months ago, an artist named Jeff Rowe got in touch with me. Uh, completely out of the blue, complete stranger to me, and he sent me an email mentioning and showing me a visual example of the logo uh, and saying in it, you, you'll notice that with a few little tweaks, the Lucid Pixel logo becomes a perfect ambigram, meaning you can flip it uh, 180 degrees and it reads identically both ways. And it wasn't only his idea, but it was his design aesthetic and the cleverness of what he had done that really immediately inspired me. And I didn't even reply to him right away. I instead spent the next two, three hours. I dropped everything and I just started messing around with his concept. And I really had fun with it. And I sent it to him along with a huge thank you letter and thinking kind of that's it, where that's kind of where it is and thanks for your help and blah, blah, blah. No, he comes back the next day with another five, 10 ideas. And every single time, I threw ideas back at him. He came back with me and showed me just how far we could evolve this idea. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, this guy's like an endless well of improvement on a concept. It's crazy. And it was just an incredibly fun experience. Eventually, we settled on an idea that I, to say the least, I am absolutely satisfied with. Not only because um, it's a reflection of great design aesthetic, thanks to Jeff, um, but it's also a reflection of a, a very friendly and very exciting collaboration between me and him and, uh, and a friendship that ensued. We ended up jumping on Skype a little bit later on. First time we had spoken after the, the, the logo was already designed and we hit it off as wonderfully in person as we did professionally, just communicating via email back and forth. And that to me is what this logo represents. I like the fact that that friendship has seeped into this logo. It, 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 it adds an element of happiness to, the, to this logo to me, which matters, right? To me, I'm all about energy. So, this, so to this, I wanna say uh, again, a huge thank you to Jeff Rowe for his friendship and for his incredible talent and his time that he invested in helping me redesign the logo. And of course, all of his information is going to be in the description below. The guy is an incredible artist, so go check it out for yourself. And without further ado, let's get on with the video. Hey guys, it's Adam from Lucid Pixel and welcome back. Today I want to talk about a bit of a sensitive topic. And it's sensitive because of the public stigma that goes behind it. And that's the subject of unemployment, the subject of not having work. And the reason why this is a sensitive topic is because on a personal level, this can be a reflection of our competence, our personality, our validity as human beings on this planet. And I want to debunk this. Furthermore, I want to offer you some productive, practical feedback on how to navigate unemployment when you find yourself in this situation. I'd also like to offer you something else, and that is a means to reduce the stress and the shame and the embarrassment that might come with it. And why all these different things can play into why we keep it a secret and we suffer alone, so to speak. So I think the the best way to start this 
is to be personal about it. Relate to you my personal experiences with unemployment, which I've had more than once. Unemployment played a very big role in my life professionally, and it's something I had to learn how to navigate around. And I've spoken about that in earlier art talks, how this derailed my artistic growth, or at least my professional artistic path, how this created a lot of financial insecurity, or I couldn't really invest in anything long term because I was always, always kind of had one foot out the door ready for when the ball dropped and I would have to save up all my earnings. So to start off, I'm going to try just off the top of my head to remember some of the reasons why I got laid off from different jobs. In some cases, it was because I wasn't a good enough artist yet. I was a little bit too amateur. I was a little bit too novice. I hadn't quite refined my process yet. I think this played a very big role in why very often I would have a presentable enough portfolio, but then when I got the job, I struggled to execute the job effectively. So what played into that? Well, the first thing was the fact that I didn't have a solid process. I wasn't settled in how to break down the artistic process. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that when I would step up to plate to produce a piece of art, because I didn't have a set process, a lot of it was trial and error. And of course, there's trial and error that goes into every work of art that you do, but it was in great part a trial and error process. The drawing itself, getting the references for that drawing, the value, the color, the composition, the expression, the gesture, the visual storytelling, the rendering. All of this was very experimental, particularly in the first, I'd say, five years of my career. And as such, by the time I got to the end of a work of art, by the time I actually completed a painting that I was satisfied with, and it was always satisfaction. It wasn't elation or joy or pride. It was satisfaction. It's kind of like I finally made, up, made it up the top of the hill and I'm still alive to tell the tale. By the time I got to the top of that hill and completed the piece, if you had asked me to backtrack the process, I probably would have forgotten by then. It took so long and it was such a confusing, complicated frustrating process that by the time I got to the end, I couldn't tell you how I got there. And the reason this was a problem was because when I get hired at the studio and they say, Hey, Adam, I really like that work that you did there. I would go into a state of panic. I would think to my, the first thing I would think to myself is, Oh crap. How did I do that? And it was, I almost got thrown into a, into a situation where I felt like I was plagiarizing somebody else's work, where I was trying to mimic somebody else's style when it wasn't somebody else's style. It was technically mine, if you could call it a style. So I would be, I would throw myself back into this trial and error process. But in this particular case, I was working on a different work of art. So in many ways, different rules applied. So the process I used to achieve one piece, as well as I could remember it, didn't necessarily apply to this next one. And this ended up really messing things up for me. It was very stressful. It was very overwhelming. I would sometimes just not pull off good enough work. By the time my, the, 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 the alarm went off and it was time for me to hand in my work, I knew I wasn't there and my client or my director or whoever would look at it and go, no, oh, that's not good enough, Adam. It's not good enough. Well, maybe they'd be more diplomatic about it and say, hmm, I think this needs work. But ultimately what they were saying was, that's not good enough. And they were right. It wasn't good enough. So that's one reason. Another reason was political, in a sense, particularly when you get into managerial jobs, direction, supervision, that kind of thing. 
There are different ways to manage. And as they say, hindsight is always twenty twenty. There's directors, there's teachers, there's mentors. These are all different ways to, to guide, to lead, to direct people, to manage. And I wasn't clear when I walked into my first supervision job where I, where I had artists under me that I was responsible for. I wasn't quite clear on what that role entailed. And I'd say that one of the big issues that I dealt with was a little bit of hoof and mouth disease. And that's kind of a joking expression, basically meaning I didn't yet, I hadn't yet refined my brain to mouth filter. I said it like I thought it, I was being honest. To me, if you're gonna solve a problem, just say it like it is. But I hadn't yet learned professional diplomacy. Or at least, how could I word this more honestly? I didn't know how to bullshit to keep my job. Now that might sound like I'm, I'm boasting about my honesty or I'm, that I'm just a very edgy person. But I regard this as a little bit of, well, lack of experience. And as such, when there was a problem and I knew where the problem was coming from, because there's always little nitpicky there's always drama that goes on in studios very often he said she said type of stuff that i would go outright and say it and say this is the problem and this is where the problem's coming from but what i was taking for granted was the fact that where i felt that problem was coming from was somebody who'd already established a very good name for themselves for better or worse reasons be it through honest or dishonest means, they had made a good name for themselves and they were providing the product to that studio up to the studio's standard effectively for for several years. So there was a lot of pe people that already put a lot of faith into, um, into this artist or this director or whoever we were dealing with. And I walk in after a couple of weeks or months and I already start in a sense, complaining about them or showing them up. And that just doesn't work. It was stupidity. I should have kept my mouth. I should have kept my thoughts to myself, right or wrong. It doesn't matter. It's not a question of being right or wrong. I should have been more thoughtful. I should have been more of an observer than a talker. And the problem with me was I shot my mouth off before I thought, and I paid the price for that because it was only a matter of time when they realized that Adam's coming in and starting drama but they let me go. Now, don't mistake this as being me, a, being a person who comes in, rattles the cages and gets all everybody up in a tiff. I'm not a troublemaker in that sense. But if there was something that implicated me or something that, something that implicated my team, well, my policy for solving things was let's see this for what it is. Now, this isn't always a problem. In some studios it is, particularly the big studios. And the reason why a mouthy person, or at least a, a person who doesn't, I doesn't think before they talk, the reason why this is an issue in bigger studios is because there's far less flexibility to change the structure of a big studio. So if somebody comes in and complains about something, if that is a fundamental flaw of the studio, which very often is, Basically, what you're saying is you don't get along with the policies of the company. And as such, I now, years later, understand why on my firing letter, it was written, does not mesh well with the company culture. I didn't know what the hell to think of that back then. It just sounded like some friendly euphemism so I could collect unemployment insurance. Just a friendly way of saying it didn't work out. But that was actually a little bit specific. It was a way of saying he didn't want to play politics. He was trying to change something that's out of his reach to change. That's not his job. In reality, it's not. When it comes to a big studio like that, it's like it or lump it. Unless you're the CEO of a company, then you're not going to make any big fundamental changes. At least not as an entry-level manager. Looking back, I can see that I needed to be more careful. I needed to think more. Don't be the first to go out and complain about something. Be an observer. 
Listen to everybody's story. Let it simmer for as long as it needs to simmer and only address the issue out loud if need be. And what I've realized from experiences, if you wait long enough, very often the problem solves itself. You've got to put faith in the fact that you aren't the only person experiencing the friction of a studio. Let it play out. But I ended up on the chopping block again. Other times, it wasn't my fault. Other times, it's just the way shit happens. The studio has layoffs. The budgets get cut. They have to let people go. And depending on the type of studio, they'll either get rid of the artists first or they'll get rid of the managers first. I'd say the majority of the time, a director or a manager is more likely to get sacked first because a manager isn't producing the art. The art is the visual product that clients need to receive. Artists are also paid considerably less than supervisors and directors very often. So you can live without a director for a short little period of time, depending on the project, if you have competent senior artists on the team, until you can find somebody to fill that spot. So it's economically a little bit safer and a little bit more secretive to get rid of a manager than it is to get rid of the artist, confided they're not laying off a bunch of them. Now, I've seen studios that have laid off or, or have had laid off a bunch of seniors or had seniors leave because they just couldn't handle the company politics anymore and kind of mutinied and all did a walkout, essentially, leaving the studio in a very panicked situation. But that's... That's few and far between. Usually the cases, they lay off people here and there, and that just happens. But then again, I find myself on the chopping block again. So you can see that more than once, I found myself in a situation where I was dealing with unemployment. Sometimes it was very quick. Sometimes I had a, 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 another job waiting for me. Sometimes it was a couple of weeks. Sometimes it was several months. Sometimes it was over half a year. Hey, it could have just as easily been over a year. And that's very common, particularly if you live in a country that offers decent unemployment insurance. What we end up doing is we give ourselves a little bit of a break and we live off of the meager unemployment insurance until that starts to hit the end. We start to feel the noose tighten around our neck as, the, as we see the deadline of that unemployment insurance start to quickly approach and then we go into panic mode and we look for work. Now, every single time I found myself in a state of unemployment, at the beginning, I blamed it on my competence, which was partially true. So what I'd end up doing is thinking to myself, I lack skill. The problem with how I approached it in some cases, not in every case, but in some cases was to learn a new skill learning Flash animation or learning After Effects or learning Premiere or learning 3D Maya or Softimage or learning 3DS Max or anything, just any program that I felt would make me more marketable. In some cases, especially early on when, for instance, 3D was still relatively in its, in its infancy, the world, the, the industry wasn't, wasn't inundated with 3D artists. When I learned 3D, I did find unemployment pretty quickly. And I'm grateful that I learned because I learned skills, not only artistically, but I also learned professional skills and was given access to certain jobs like direction, for instance, that I never would have been offered had I not known 3D. But in other cases, I feel that this was, in a sense, one of my biggest mistakes that delayed my growth at the beginning of my career. By starting a new program and doing this repetitively, every single time I lost a job, I would learn new skills. Not to say that learning new skills is bad, but, be, but doing so in an attempt to, in a sense, redefine my career, I put my core skill on the back burner, which was being 
an artist, a concept artist, an illustrator, a 2D guy. And I don't entirely blame myself because back in the time, being a 2D guy was a scary, very unpredictable thing. A lot more so than it is today. So I'm redefining myself, and every single time I redefine myself, it's starting over from scratch. That's a big deal. That's a very big burden to put on your shoulders, learning an entirely new software from scratch, but bringing it up to a, a level that allow, that where you can produce a portfolio and apply to jobs with this skill. That's a big endeavor. I mean, I managed to pull it off and get these jobs, but then I might lose my job again. Maybe there was another layoff. It was very common. And there I was again, unemployed, thinking to myself, I got to start over again. I got to start over again. And it took me a long time for me to eventually one day stop and say, wait a minute, Adam, stop. Just stop. Stop redefining yourself. You, you chase after a new skill. You learn it. You get hired. You get laid off. Then you go back and you start all over from scratch again. You can't keep doing this. I had literally exhausted myself and I just couldn't do it anymore. I was just fed up of starting over with some new skill over and over again. Looking back, I acquired numerous valuable skills. HTML, building my own website, uh, uh, 3D, Flash, Premiere, After Effects, Soft Image. You name it, all of these different skills. I, I'm grateful for having that knowledge, but I'm not grateful for the incredible struggle it took me to get to that point. I would encourage anybody to learn new skills, but learn them when you have the peace of mind of receiving an income, of being employed, and you can take a couple of hours in the evening, hook up with, sorry, wrong word, I'm 43, I gotta reuse, getting together, hanging out with one of your friends. You can hook up with them too, but that's, that's, that's a different story, you know? But um, uh, you get together with friends and learn some skills on the side when you have money, when you're in a relaxed, receptive state, not when you're in a state of panic. I still learn new software all the time. I'm, I love new software. I love keeping up with the latest trends, the new technology, the new apps, the new programs all the time. But I do it on my free time. I've got a couple of hours off. I'm not working. I head down to the cafe. I grab a latte. I sit down with my iPad and I explore new shit. I do it all the time. I love doing that. But not when I'm in a state of financial panic. I'm not thinking clearly under those circumstances. The other thing that happens is that, or the thing that did happen was that I would start to seriously doubt my competence. So as I'm redefining myself, I'm also really hating on myself for being somebody who sucks, somebody who's not good enough. I don't know about you, if you've ever been in this situation, but I spent many years of my life where I very often found myself in this situation thinking or feeling like the black sheep, feeling like in an industry full of people that are employed and happy and they've been there for five, six years and they're hunky-dory, there's incompetent, stupid, not good enough Adam who's not getting that job. I felt like the oddball. I felt like the that one percentile of incompetent artists that just didn't have honest parents when they needed to said, Adam, do something else. You're not suited for this job. And I, honest to God, despite having a lifetime of being a passionate artist and always being recognized as Adam the artist in school, in elementary, in high school, in university, despite all of that, felt like I wasn't good enough. I wasn't as good as my peers. They had the skills I didn't have. And I blamed a lot of my unemployment on that, of just being bad at art. Now, looking back right now, I realize I had a lot more experience skill-wise than a lot of my friends because I started earlier. But what I lacked was focus. <clears throat> I didn't have a set direction in my artwork. And as a result of that, 
I kept zigzagging artistically, exploring this style, exploring that style, going this way, going that way, never committing myself to anything over a long enough period of time to get masterful at it. And it was that lack of mastery in any one skill that ultimately made me less employable because directors looked at a lot of mediocre work and nothing fantastic. When I always had the ability to create fantastic work, I just had let it go years before. And it was that lack of confidence. It was that redefining of myself, that starting over from scratch all the time that made me think that the core skill I already possessed wasn't sufficient. And maybe for a short period of time, it truly wasn't, but that wasn't very long. I rode this wave of not trusting that skill due to having a few very negatively influential years at the beginning of my professional career. It really defined me in a negative way for several years. Going around, or at least coming around full circle, I found myself deep in my professional career. I had graduated school many years before, and I found myself at a crossroads. The crossroads was a combination of being really frustrated, tired, feeling like, Adam, you should be doing well at this point in your career. You're old now. That's why I have a lot of, well, the old, uh, old to me back then, not old to me today. Today, looking back, it was silly for me to think this, but I felt like I was too old. I felt like I wasn't good enough. I felt like I completely lacked focus. I was completely frustrated. And I'm looking at my, one of my last unemployment checks, thinking to myself, I can't do this anymore. I was just defeated. I was exhausted and I really didn't fucking feel like doing this all over again. I couldn't do it. And that thought made me extremely sad because I didn't know who else to be. For decades of my life, Adam Duff was defined as the artist. That was my identity. And the thought of giving that up was heartbreaking. And at that very point in my life, I, I, I was forced into making one of two smart decisions. But the only decisions I had ahead of me were smart ones. Opposite, but equally smart decisions. The choice on the left was giving up art and taking up another skill entirely. Like, screw art, learn computer science, learn web design, learn computer programming, learn engineering, something marketable, marketing, PR, medicine. Learn something that has a very high demand. That would have been a smart move. I'm committing myself to something. I have proven to myself how hard I can persevere, how hard I can push myself. I knew that if I applied one fifteenth of the effort into building a career into something that was just higher in demand, I would have a very good chance of success. On the other hand, my choice was to say, Adam, stop redefining yourself. Make this your last ditch effort, all in. Just go balls to the wall, traditional art. Become that unapologetic, full force illustrator, 2D illustrator. Screw 3D, screw flash, screw After Effects, screw everything, just become great at illustration. And that day, I decided to go all in. I was taking, in my opinion, I was taking a huge chance. But at least I was taking a chance with something that I was very well versed in, something I had many years of experience in. And that very day, that website 
that I programmed myself in HTML, that had 3D that I'd learned on my own in Maya. I erased it. I deleted that website and I deleted the art to go with it. I wanted no trace of it. I didn't want to be able to chicken out and go back. I erased it. And when it's a digital copy, erasing things is permanent. And I started over from scratch and I decided to go full force into digital painting, concept art, illustration. And something remarkable happened. It might not have. I'm not saying take this route because this is what's going to happen. I'm saying this is what happened to me. It all fell together. It all fell into place because I realized at that point in my life that the world had changed and I didn't realize it. That that trend of 3D only get rid of all the 2D artists came and went very quickly. And now 2D illustration, concept art, traditional animation, all of those traditional artistic skills that I had spent my entire life learning all came flooding back. And the full quality and the full depth of who I had made myself over decades of hard work all came together. And I built my portfolio. I did it on unemployment. I was receiving unemployment checks at the time, meager unemployment checks. And I was also a smoker back there too. So <laughs> I'm sure at least 50% of my paychecks were going towards smokes. And I rebuilt my portfolio from scratch. I rebuilt my website from scratch. And before I got a chance to apply to my first job, I got an email. An email from somebody who had discovered me online saw my work through some random web search, found my website and called me up and asked me if I wanted to produce art for them. And I didn't reply right away. Not because I was playing business, I was playing hard. Not because I was acting aloof, because I couldn't believe my goddamn eyes. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I had spent years of my life throwing my CVs to the wind all over the city, just trekking it all over. There was no emails back then. You had to physically take the subway and the bus all around town and ha physically hand your personalized CV and cover letter to every single company that you approached. And none of them ever called me back. If they did, they were for the crappy jobs I didn't really want. The ones that I just applied to because they were, quote, art related, but they weren't the kind of art that I liked. And somebody wrote me up and said, Adam, would you like to meet us? We really like your stuff. Based on a portfolio that had only been online for around three weeks. And I almost felt like crying. Because... If anything, I needed a break. I needed a break from feeling so unloved in this industry. I felt so completely rejected. I felt like such an unpopular guy in this industry. And I wrote them back the next day and I said, sure, I'd love to meet you. And I jumped on the subway and I went across town and I met them downtown at a nice studio and we sat down and I got along beautifully with the director. He was a traditional artist just like me with an animation background and we hit it off like best friends and I got the job and it was a really cool job and it was a really fun job working on the type of project that I really was excited about and I continued to do that for around five, six months. 
it was co- it was technically freelancing from home, which was also kind of cool. And directly following that, I had also uh, just happened to go to uh, uh, UB campus, uh, which was originally the time the the school that was f- subsidized by Ubisoft in Montreal. And I went there applying to take a course to enhance my skills. And the the director of UB campus uh, told me that I might have mentioned this in an earlier art talk that um, she really liked my stuff. Would I ever consider teaching? And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> again, somebody's offering me work when I'm not asking for it. And we, I went to the Cégep du Vieux Montréal, the uh, Cégep of Old Montreal. It's a French college in Montreal in the animation department. And I met the faculty there. We sat down in the conference room and they asked me to demonstrate some of my skills on the fly. And I did. And I got hired. And I've mentioned this many times in the past. I walked into that teacher's lounge for the first time and I sat down with all of these teachers and I fell in love with every one of them within the first 15 minutes of being there. They had the same nerdy fascination, their over-enthusiastic, chatty, loud mouth, giddy, immature personality that I had. And I looked at them with big freaking glitters in my eyes. I mean, if you ever saw a kawaii face on Adam, that was the day, you know? And I'm just sitting there going, oh my God, you people are beautiful people. Oh, and we all loved the same thing. And one of one of the teachers, Dan, walks up to me and he says, are you, do you know this artist? And I said, Bobby Chu, of course, everybody knows Bobby Chu. He had his book. And he goes, yeah, yeah, kind of your artwork kind of reminds me of his stuff. And I said, well, shit, thank you. <laughs> There's a compliment I'll never forget. And then somebody else, we're talking about Don Bluth. And I'm like, yes, yes, Don Bluth. Of course, this is the kind of stuff I used to watch on repeat when I was a kid that my mother used to yell at me. She's like, Adam, stop playing. Stop rewinding the goddamn video all the time. Because I kept watching the same scene on loop. I was so excited. I was so home. I look back at those at the, at that day at that decision as the happiest and most wonderful decision of my life. But I will never forget the big long circle that I had to make to find myself back there again. I had to utterly lose myself for many years. I had to hate myself. I had to be poor. I had to be broke. I had to feel incompetent. I had to have bill chasers chasing, bill chasers chasing after me. I had to wake up and go to sleep with a feeling of self-doubt and an absolute lack of confidence in the direction I was going to finally choose to know myself and have faith in myself the best thing I ever learned in my life. That's why every time I see that scene from the matrix where the Oracle, where Neo looks over the Oracle's threshold in their kitchen over the door. And he looks at that sign written in Latin and she looks at him and smiles. And she says, it says, know thyself to me. That's the most important lesson any person can ever learn. You will only ever be a master at being yourself. That's the biggest lesson I had to learn as a professional. Now, before I let you go, I want to offer a few little practical tips on how to navigate unemployment. Now that I've given you a good dose of my absolutely horrific past. (laughs) And that is... If you're going to find work, and I've heard Bobby Chu say this too as well, if you're going to find work, don't take an art job you don't like. That was a big mistake. I'll give you a few examples of art jobs that I took because I needed to pay the bills that looking back were literally a waste of time. One of them was working on a CD-ROM game for Dora the Explorer. 
Another one was working on a, another CD-ROM game. No, actually, this was a slot machine for, for the Montreal uh, Casino. Slot, animated slot machines. Shit job. Another one was... Actually, I learned, I learned how to speak a bit of a, a different language, but I was working at the Bronfman Jewish Educational Center, the BJEC. And uh, I, I made... It was actually a little bit fun. But I was making, uh, again, CD-ROM games to teach kids Hebrew, which was kind of neat. And I was completely immersed in the Jewish community, which was kind of fun too. I don't know, what were some of the things I learned? I remember, if you ever see a CD-ROM game with a cook, an animated cook cartoon, and he says, Uh-oh, toast shachor, <laughs> and you have tostov. Ah, you see, I still remember to this day because I had to watch, I had to animate that scene 6,000 times. Yeah, um, that would be me that animated that. And you might laugh at my shitty art from back then as well. But that's not where I wanted to go with my career. It was a, it was a job. It was a job that I got because it had the word art associated to it and it had a paycheck associated to it. And you know what? Sometimes that's the best we can take. So fine. But if I had the choice, I would have taken a job that was not artistic. I would have skipped out on that slot machine job. I would have skipped out on that, you know, that 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 CD-ROM game for Dora. I would have skipped out on that because what it does is it consumes your creative energy. Art takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of commitment. It takes a lot of focus. Even if it's art you don't like. And when you do that for eight hours and then you go home, you don't have it in you anymore to build your own portfolio. You want to take a damn break from drawing. Particularly since the drawings you had done all day turned you off of art. And it also illustrates another very important point about drawing. If you're producing art, but you feel demotivated at the same time, a very good reason why you might be demotivated is because you're producing a type of art that you don't find exciting. It's like a song. When I dance, when I go salsa dancing, if a song I love is on, I can dance. I, I, I'll never run out of energy. I can dance for, for four hours straight and I'll just keep going and going and going. But if the song is, does not connect with me emotionally, if it just doesn't resonate with me, I'll have a hard time getting my feet off the ground. I'll, I won't even want to stand up. I just, I'll wait for a good song to come on because I know what, what, a, what an impact music has on dancing. And it's the same thing with art. If you're working on a type of art that doesn't speak to you or if you're producing art, confided you're not learning the fundamentals, but if you're... If you're producing art at a more advanced level, but you feel very demotivated, it's, it's going to turn you off of art. So start to explore different subjects, different styles that might be more exciting to you and find that one that really allows you to communicate. You can see the type of art that I like to do. Why? Because that's the kind of stuff that excites me. Endlessly. The next thing is, Understand that you aren't alone when you're unemployed. Understand that if you've allowed your unemployment check to expire and you haven't found a job yet, you're not a washed up loser of an artist. It happens to the best of us. I've known many artists in my career and we've, we've allowed ourselves to get comfortable and cozy with that unemployment check coming in. It's happened. But use that time. If you are going to not apply right away for a job, don't wait until the last second. Don't wait until you're in a state of panic to update your portfolio. Because when you're in a state of panic, you don't produce great work. You want to be in a relaxed state that allows you to take your time and focus and grow and produce artwork that you're happy with artwork that 
can stand the test of time because you might not be able to update your portfolio when you're working full time for many years ahead of you. So you have to prepare for that. So keep a steady daily pace of productivity. So when you do, when you when it is time, when you're looking and you've only got about a third left of your unemployment, then you can start applying and you have a really good portfolio to show for it. But don't wait till the last second. That's If you can avoid it, avoid it. A third very important piece of advice is don't over diversify yourself. This plays into what I was talking about when I was, quote, learning new skills. Stay focused on a single task. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. I'm very often approached, asked the question, how many brushes do you use in Photoshop? And my answer is, although I might have 50 brushes or a thousand brushes in my brush palette, I only have a selection of four brushes that I use all the time. And out of those four, there's one that I'm a master of. A brush is like an instrument. It's like a musical instrument. I might be able to play every instrument on that stage, but I am a master of one of them. Like Harry Connick Jr. He can play every instrument on that stage. He can compose, he can play every instrument on that stage, but he is first and foremost a pianist and a jazz pianist at that. And when he plays his jazz piano man, he shines, he glitters. The same thing applies to your art. If you over diversify yourself, you're watering yourself down. So when it comes time to really producing something you want to get a job in, a focused career in, don't try to learn 10 new skills. Just focus on that one. If you can't build a website yourself, don't sweat it. You can download free templates, html5.net. $3, you'll have a new website. You just have to learn how to manipulate a little bit of code. You can do that in a day. Okay? Or Pixelarity, is, it also goes by that name. But focus on your art. And more specifically, focus on a specific career. Getting a job in, quote, art is not going to get you a job in art. You want to get a job specifically in fantasy illustrations for trading card games and book illustrations. Concept art for video games. What kind of video games? Sci-fi video games. What kind of video games? Action RPG video games. MMO. Focus on a specific style of art that really resonates with you. I want to get a job working on the next Guillermo del Toro film because I love his quirky Alice in Wonderlandy dark approach to art and design. Maybe Miyazaki and work on a next Souls game. I could very easily find myself in that situation. If Miyazaki came and said, uh, Adam, would you mind doing a few designs for my game? I'd be like, uh, yes. What do you, uh, how much do you charge? Uh, free. In fact, I'll pay you. <laughs> That's how much I feel suited for that job. That's how much I would love that opportunity. But no, I don't work for free, so pay me my bills. You know what I'm saying? But be specific with your, with your approach. Don't diversify. I swear to God, as a director, the number one thing that would turn me off of people's portfolios is when they've got a 10-page portfolio that shows 10 different skills and guaranteed they weren't particularly strong at any one of them. Or they might have been strong at one, but it was diluted in all of these weaker skills. And that doesn't look good. That looks bad. And first and foremost, I want to leave you with this. Understand that no matter where you are in terms of age, no matter how hard you are on yourself, the most important thing you can do is understand that you're not alone. You're part of a community of artists that if we are all this candid, would all tell you the same thing. And I guarantee you, the more advanced, the more celebrated, the more popular, the richer, the older the artist you're speaking to, the more stories of hardship they'll be able to share with you. It's all part of the game. But you know what? It's not a bad thing. Hardship is what forges us. Hardship is what defines us. Hardship, my hardship in my life, is what empowered me to be able to share these stories with you, to be able to help you, to help you grow. 
I had to eat crow to be able to help you. I know that now. So I want you to be able to take a more honest and compassionate perspective of yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. Have some compassion for yourself and realize that it just takes time. It takes patience. And if you're, if you're suffering, if you're having a hard time, it's okay. It's just suffering. You're going to be just fine. All right? So with that said, I very much love you with all my heart. Thank you for sticking it out. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like. And if you loved it, don't forget to sub. And happy painting. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you.